Once again, good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Meher Besanya, and at the outset, I would like to welcome you all to another interesting webinar of WZCC. Good morning, WZCC Global President Edel Dawar. Good evening, WZCC Global Directors and Chapter Chairs, Senior Officials of Confederation. Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Indian Merchants Chamber, Confederation of Indian Industry, the Organization of Pharmaceutical Producers of India, the Guild of Entrepreneurs UK, other multinational companies, WZCC members, and a special welcome to our distinguished speaker, Lord Karen Billy Moria, who is the member of the House of Lords, President of the Confederation of British Industry, founder of Four Brothers, and a Chancellor of the Birmingham University. It was indeed a long wait for all of us, but now that Lord Billy Moria is with us, members will be able to interact easily. The Confederation of British Industry is a premier business organization in the UK, which represents 190,000 businesses and employees, nearly 7 million employees. It provides a voice for firms at regional, national, and international level to policymakers. Lord Billy Moria's timing couldn't be better for the talk as we see UK is slowly reopening after the COVID-19 pandemic. This talk will be interlaced with topics on lessons learned from COVID-19, Britain after leaving the European Union and business and investment opportunities in trade and globally. Let me commence by saying that pursuing excellence has always been one of the key objectives of WZCC and in line with that objective, we have started a new series of bringing the doings to dialogue with business community members on important topics. This is our third webinar, and we are pleased to bring you none other than Lord Billy Moria, member of the House of Lords and president of the Confederation of British Industry. Thank you, Lord Billy Moria, for accepting WZCC's invitation and joining us today. I request Dorab Mistri from UK to introduce Lord Billy Moria to the business and professional community. A word on Dorab, he is an international trading and investment professional and authority on vegetable oil price forecasting, whose predictions are closely followed. He was president of the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe from 1997 to 2005. He is currently based in Singapore and is the director at the Godrej International Limited and Godrej International Trading and Investments Limited. So, Rab, the floor is all yours. Well, uh, Karan is very much an iconic figure in the Zoroastrian community, but I'm sure all of you have read his very detailed bio data, which Mayor has circulated, and he truly is a person who does, does not need an introduction. But there are two aspects of his personality which I think one ought to admire and appreciate. The first, as you can see in his bio data, he is a qualified chartered accountant, qualified from EY. He also took a law degree from Cambridge, which means he would have done, or he could have done, what 99% of Zoroastrian talented, endowed, gifted young people do. They become chartered accountants, they become partners in a firm, very cushy salary all their lives, no risk, or become partners in firms of solicitors, or become barristers. Karan did no such thing. And he went in at the deep end, went into business, took all the risks that you and I would not imagine. His first business was to import polo sticks. He's always been of a royal touch, importing polo sticks into the UK from India. His polo equipment was even stocked at Harrods, but the business was not as successful as he wanted it to be. So what did he do? Change track, 
went into importing beer. Again, he was always looking at the long term, thinking big, thinking ambitious. When he brought Cobra beer to the UK, he very wisely and astutely registered the trademark in his own company so that eventually he would be able to brew and distribute the beer himself. So that is one thing, his great entrepreneurial streak, the great ability to take difficulty head on. And the second quality of Karan, which I truly admire, is that no matter what circumstances in his life, his doors to the Zoroastrian community have always been open. He has been truly a great, great asset to the Zoroastrian trust funds of Europe in the UK and to WZCC in the UK. He is in fact a key to the doors at Buckingham Palace, to 10 Downing Street, to Westminster. I shall conclude very quickly by saying that when we celebrated 10 years of Karan Bilimoria in the House of Lords, the leader of the Hindu community who was there that day, and he spoke in Gujarati and he said, Lord Bilimoria ek che, pan akhi cricket team na samale che. That is for you, the great son of our community, Lord Karan Bilimoria. Over to you, Karan. Dorab, thank you very much. And, and hello to all of you. Can you all hear me uh, clearly and see me clearly? Can somebody yep. wave? Yes. Okay, yes. yes. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, firstly, Dorab, thank you for your very, very kind words, which uh, I, um, mean a lot to me. I've known you for many years, and uh, you have uh, always been a great leader of our community here in, in, in the UK. And I've, uh, throughout, whenever I need advice of whether I should do something or not, the first person I go to is Dorab, and I always know I get the wisest of advice from you, Dorab. So thank you very much. And Mayor, thank you for your kind words, and thank you for organizing this worldwide event. I think we have uh, members of our community from Australia to America to Canada to Europe to the Middle East to the UK and India and beyond and Singapore. Um, so this is fantastic. And it just shows that one of the tiniest communities in the world, uh, we are everywhere uh, and omnipresent. So th thank you so much. And, and I, I look forward to spending this time with you. And what I've been asked to do is, is, is share some thoughts about this world that we're living in now and then have a discussion uh, for as long as you'd like. Uh, and, and I'd like to leave as much time for, for the discussion. And yes, Deepantra, thank you also uh, for all that you have done. And Edel, uh, Edel Dabar as well, thank you. Uh, for everything that you do for the WZCC and for our, our community. So this crisis that we're in, you know, people used to talk about black swan events, events that come out of nowhere that nobody predicts. You look back, 9-11 uh, was a black swan event. Nobody ever predicted something like that would happen and it changed the world. It changed the way we, we live and, and, and travel um, and many other the cold geopolitical stage of the world was transformed by that one event. You go to the financial crisis and looking back on it, you say, well, we should have seen that that subprime crisis would lead to the credit crunch, which would lead then to the financial crisis, which would lead then to the great recession, which would lead then to the Eurozone crisis and would lead then to a decade of austerity and recovery in many countries after that. How many people predicted that? One was Raghuram Rajan. Um, our fellow um, Indian who was um, governor of the Reserve Bank of India and now at the University of Chicago. But not many people did. And here we are with this, with this pandemic. This pandemic came out of nowhere. In this country, we spent from June 2016, well, actually since February 2016, the Brexit referendum campaign. June was a result when Britain voted narrowly to leave the European Union. And from June 2016 until December 2019, our whole world was taken up by Brexit. We had a Prime Minister, Theresa May, who lost her majority, who then lost power. We had Boris Johnson, who came in last summer. And finally, Brexit actually happened in January this year, 31st of January, Britain left uh, the European Union. And we're now in this transition period, and we're coming up now to December when whatever happens, that period is over and Britain has said we will not extend it. 
and there are talks going on as we speak. In fact, today, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is speaking to von der Leyen, the present European Commission, to have talks, and we're hoping the good news is that we will probably get a deal. We can talk about that more in the discussion, of course, what sort of a deal, but any deal at this stage would be better uh, than no deal. So that world of Brexit, which was, everything was Brexit, the newspapers, the radios, the TV, everything was Brexit. And then this pandemic came. And the pandemic came out of nowhere. And I remember in March, the 5th of March, a day I will remember very clearly, my various roles um, that uh, Meher spoke about, Dorab spoke about, some of them. Um, I, of course, am chairman of Cobra Beer. That is a, an everyday part of my life. I'm a member of the House of Lords now for 14 years. That is an everyday part of my life. And I'm a chancellor of the University of Birmingham and also just since June taken over as president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, which is the biggest business organization in the UK. Uh, it has 190,000 businesses we speak for, including almost all the FTSE 100, FTSE 250, and employ 7 million employees, one third of the private sector workforce in the UK. And I'm the first ethnic minority president in the 60 year history of the CBI. Um, and we have a director general, Dame Carolyn Fairburn. So in that role that is now since June um, has been an amazing role to have in this particular time in history. I mean, at any time to be president of CBI is a major role and a big responsibility, but to be president at this particular time, to have been thrown into the deep end um, has been the most extraordinary experience. So I was on the 5th of, 5th of, of March in Birmingham University. I had a day at Birmingham with meetings, speeches, as chancellor of the university, it's one of the biggest universities in the country. And I was called a few weeks before by the president of Kellogg College, Oxford, where I'm a fellow. I'm a Bynum Tudor fellow since 2018. And he said, Karen, we need you in Oxford, whatever you're doing for a few hours in the afternoon of the 5th of March, because Prince Charles is being admitted to the same fellowship that you have. And we would like the Bynum Tudor fellows, there are four of you at the moment, um, please to be there to receive him and welcome him as a fellow, fellow Bynum Tudor fellow. So please, if you're in Birmingham, just come back down towards London for an hour and go back to Birmingham and then go back to London late at night, but you have to be there. So I remember going there and we welcomed Prince Charles and we were all shaking hands at that time. And he spoke to me about the CBI, he said, I heard here, you've just taken over as president of the CBI. What happened? 10 days later, 15th of March, a Sunday, I fell ill very suddenly from nowhere. And I try to keep fit. Um, I play tennis, I do boxing in the gym, I go to the gym regularly, Pilates, four days of exercise amongst all my work, absolutely fit. And then from nowhere on the Sunday, it hit me from nowhere and I succumbed to COVID. And I was in bed, I worked through the whole of it. I lost my sense of smell and taste, weak fever, um, that the smell and taste was not an official symptom at that time. And then I experienced how important this health crisis is. I phoned the parliamentary hotline and I was told, I said, can I have a test? I said, I'm so sorry, Lord Billamoria. The testing has been withdrawn two days ago. We do not have the capacity and we are saving the capacity only for patients who are admitted to hospital, not even just to reassure you the doctors and the staff in our hospitals can get tested. That is how bad the situation was then. Fast forward a few days later, and Prince Charles falls in, falls ill with COVID. Fast forward a few days later, and Boris Johnson, our prime minister, falls ill with COVID. And fast forward a few days, 23rd of March, we impose the lockdown in this country. And the world changed. Now, luckily, I was all right. It took me two weeks to recover. A month later, I had antibody tests. I have strong antibodies. I was fine. I got my sense of smell and taste back. And touch wood, I have no long lasting effects. I don't know, but I presume not. Um, I'm back in the gym and I'm back boxing and I'm back playing tennis and scuba diving and all the other things I love doing and keeping fit. Prince Charles is fine. Boris Johnson, well, he's recovered. He's lost a lot of weight. 
and he realized how important it is now uh, to try and stay fit. But that lockdown on the 23rd of March, for three and a half months, we were, my business, Cobra Beer, where 7,000 restaurants we supply, makes up a big part of my business. Those restaurants were shut. Offices were shut. Our factories that brew Cobra Beer here in the UK, the biggest brewery in Britain, we had to slim down our workforce because many of them needed to be sheltered and shielded. So from producing a range of products from draft beer to cans, to small bottles, to big bowls, to gluten-free, to King Cobra, to Malabar IPA, to all our different varieties, the brewery said, we can only produce one bottle and that's the big bottle for the supermarkets. We have no more capacity to produce anything else. And by the way, that's only less than one third of our business, the supermarkets. So for those three and a half months, my restaurants were shut and we were reliant on one stock keeping unit in the supermarkets to survive as a business and we survived. Now one of the lessons and many lessons that come out of this is how resilient are you as a business to deal with a shock like this? And this is a shock as big as you can get. Um, can, do you have the resilience and do you have the adaptability? I've always had this mantra, adapt or die. Throughout my business journey of the last three decades, you have to either adapt or die. And I wouldn't be here speaking to you if I hadn't adapted at various stages of my journey. And this is like the biggest example of that. Could we adapt? And we did. And we're here. And on the 4th of July, the restaurants opened again and we were allowed to start selling our, our beer into the restaurants. And we got up and running again. And we got, and then can you bounce back quickly? Can you bounce back better? Can you build back better? And in August, the government here, in a measure of confidence, to get the public to go back out to visit restaurants and bars and pubs and to help an industry that had suffered so much, had an eat out to help out scheme where the government subsidized and encouraged people to go into restaurants on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights, which are normally quiet nights. And would you believe it, restaurants were full. The people started losing their fear, going out and actually helping the businesses. It benefited the consumer, it benefited the businesses. Our sales were actually higher in August this year than they were in August 2019. And then we extended it. So then how adaptable can you be? When that promotion finished, we on our own accord had a Cobra Beer eat out to help out extension through the month of September and I haven't got my final September figures yet, but I wouldn't be too surprised if we've increased our sales in September this year compared with last year. Now, how is that possible? Well, it is possible if you can adapt. And it is possible if you've got a fantastic team. And it is possible if you have a great brand. So we can talk about more of this in the discussion of how these lessons that I learned when I nearly lost my business three times over the last three decades, the lessons that I learned and the principles have actually paid off in what we're doing now. And if you look at the government as a, uh, on the whole, our government actually acted very quickly. When the crisis started in the middle of March, we have a young chancellor, Rishi Sunak. He's a very impressive young man. He was 39 years old when he was appointed chancellor, finance minister. And I've known him, in fact, I, I know him so on the day he became a member of parliament, because his father-in-law is Narayan Murthy, the founder of Infosys, one of our legendary entrepreneurs in India. Very privileged when I was appointed as the Indo-British Partnership Chair by the British government in 2003 from the UK side, the Indian chair of the Indo-British Partnership, my counterpart was Narayan Murthy, and we became good friends from that day. And it's he that introduced me to his son-in-law, who was married to his daughter, Akshata. And I met Rishi from the time he became an MP. And he's a Yorkshire MP, he took over William Hague, the former leader of the Conservative Party seat in, in, in Richmond, Yorkshire. And Rishi is a very bright young man. He was, he was um, head boy at Winchester College, the famous school where the Nawab of Pataudi, for example, went. Um, he went to Oxford and did very well there. Went on to Stanford to do his MBA at Stanford Business School. Worked in banking and hedge funds was extremely successful and decided to go into politics. And here he is now one step away from being prime minister of this country, something I've said for a long time, that there will be a day in my lifetime that an Indian 
a nation will become prime minister of the United Kingdom. And we're not far from that day. And I go back now to making another point. Look at how far we've come, the diaspora, the, I'm talking about the Indian diaspora. And I know here we've got the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce, which is not just Indians. Um, I'm just using it as an example that how the 30 million Indians around the world are now literally getting to the very top, uh, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in, in the UK. Uh, three cabinet ministers now, including two of the great offices of state are held by Indians. Rishi Sunak is one, Preeti Patel is the home secretary and Alok Sharma is the secretary of state for business. And of course, three of them, can you imagine, in the cabinet. And to think when I came as a student 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago to this country to study, um, there was a glass ceiling. That glass ceiling has now been absolutely shattered. When we took a picture on the steps of Westminster Hall, the 900 year old building in parliament in 2012 to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the four ethnic minority mem members who were elected to parliament in 1987 when I was at Cambridge. I remember that very clearly and included Keith Vaz, included Bernie Grant, Paul Tang, Diane Abbott. And there was one Indian, uh, Lord, Lord Chitness, who was at Birmingham University with my mother, for five parliamentarians in 1987. And of course, we have our famous Parsi parliamentarians before India's independence, Father by Naroji, Manchuji Panagri, and Shapuji Saklakbala, and there was Lord Sinner. So those were the four before independence. And then there was this huge gap until 1987. And when we took that picture 25 years later, there were 69 of us on the steps of that throne. And then we took another picture just now after the elections in December. I remember very clearly, we were all on the steps and Rishi was there, a big hug, and there were 100 ethnic minority members on those steps. That's not a lot if you think about it because we have 15% ethnic minority population in this country, 15% um, and 100 out of 800 members of the House of Lords and 650 members of the House of Commons, you do the maths, that's seven, seven and a half percent. It's not even half the proportion, but we're getting there. And just this week, as the president of the CBI, I've launched an initiative um, that I'm very proud to say has got a lot of traction and it's called Change the Race Ratio. And it's to encourage ethnic minority participation in business and in leadership and there was a Parker review commissioned by the government in 2016 to look at ethnic minorities on boards of companies, and they were tiny. It was about 7.5% FTSE 100, FTSE 250 had ethnic minority board members. And they did a review of that in 2020, three and a half years later, and 39% of FTSE 100 companies do not even have a single ethnic minority board member, and 69% of FTSE 250 companies do not even have a single ethnic minority board member. And I've said we've got to change that and we've got to make sure we encourage companies to do the right thing because diversity is not just a tick box, diversity works because diversity and inclusion together, it's proven, McKinsey's have proven, the companies that have diverse boards are 39% more profitable than companies in the last quartile who do not have diverse boards. So I'm championing that. I've launched it, the announcement this week, we'll have the formal launch at the end of the month, and I've already got Microsoft and Aviva and Deloitte, and a lot of the top companies have already signed off even before it's launched. So I think diversity is really important, and we as the Zoroastrian Parsi community around the world, in our tiny way, bring that power of diversity uh, so very amazingly. So let me now go back to the economic measures Rishi Sunak's measures to help business were phenomenal. We as a tiny country, when I say tiny, 1% of the world's population, we're still the sixth largest economy in the world. And we have spent now approaching over 300 billion pounds in helping our businesses. We've taken our interest rates down to 0.1%. That is the lowest in the history since the Bank of England was founded in 1694. The Bank of England, in the lessons that it learned in the financial crisis, has imposed two rounds of quantitative easing, just like that, for 300 billion pounds. So these measures have worked. And what I've also seen has not worked is government trying to command and top down and do things without listening. What has worked is when government has listened and collaborated. 
So I remember being consulted and I said, what's the first thing? I said, nearly lost my business three times. The first thing a business will need in a time of crisis like this and uncertainty is cash. They will need access to loans. And the banks will not want to lend because it will be too risky because we don't know what's going to happen. So the government's going to have to guarantee those loans. And there are government guaranteed loans available already to help start up businesses. We've had them in the early days of COBRA. But those are 75, 80% guaranteed. I said to really make this money flow, the banks will not even be willing to take that 25, 20% risk. The government will have to guarantee 100%. What happened? They didn't listen. Initially, the loans were 80% guaranteed. Money wasn't flowing through. I kept persisting. I was the first person in the country to say this is going to be essential. I mentioned I was on a national TV program. I mentioned to cabinet minister on national TV in the middle of April. The next week, we introduced what are called the bounce back loans, which are 100% guaranteed by the government. And we have now granted over 1.2 million of those bounce back loans which are maximum 50,000 pounds that have saved literally hundreds of thousands of small and medium sized enterprises in our country, including many of my restaurant customers, because the government listened. We had a job retention furlough scheme where the government literally subsidized 80% of the salary of employees up to a limit of two and a half thousand pounds and also the equivalent for self-employed people. Nine million jobs in the, and two and a half million self-employed was saved through that government furlough scheme, which has now been tapered off, tapering off and a new version is coming out. So the government working by listening has worked. And with the health crisis, I saw how badly prepared we were for a pandemic. We're learning about a new disease and of course, the whole world is learning. We are still learning to this day how this virus behaves. There's still so much we don't know about it. We didn't have adequate protection, PPE. For our, for our hospitals, for our nursing homes. We neglected our nursing homes. And if you look at any country, whether it's Sweden, which dealt with the virus separately, or whether it's us, the care homes, the nursing home sector were neglected. We were sending patients back from hospitals without being tested back into care homes. And care homes are where elderly people are. And we know this virus sadly affects the elderly much more than the young people. In fact, if if you are hospitalized with COVID, you are 2,000 times more likely to die from COVID if you're over 80 years old, as opposed to if you're in your 20s. So that is how dangerous this disease can be for older people. And what do you do? You have to protect the care homes. The care homes didn't have the PPE and the care homes were not being tested. And testing, we were testing 2,000 patients a day in March when Germany was already testing 100,000 we had to ramp up our testing. Today, we have a capacity of 350,000 tests going up to 500,000 tests. And I've been pushing for a long time to implement mass testing, which we can talk about in the q and If somebody would ask me about mass testing, I'll give you my views on that. And the next thing I learned about the top-down not working was our biggest scare when we locked down in March was we had those films from Italy with hospitals, with patients in corridors, with not enough critical care beds. And we said, we can't have that happen to us here in the UK. And we said, what do we do? We don't have the bed capacity. So China, films of hospitals being built in days in China. We said, oh, well, only the Chinese can do that. Well, what do we do? We got the National Health Service, the government, to work with the Excel Center, big exhibition center in East London, with the University of East London, the neighboring university, with the armed forces engineers, including the Gurkhas. So you had the army, private sector, government, university sector work together. And I'm not exaggerating, in nine days, we built a critical bed hospital. In nine days, 4,000 bed hospital. And we've replicated that around the country. And they're called Nightingale hospitals. So today, we've got potentially a second wave of this virus but we're so much better prepared in dealing with it. We've got the backup critical beds. We've got the PPE, which we didn't have. We're ramping up our testing and the treatments that we've got. Uh, you heard obviously about Donald Trump and the treatments that he is getting now. These treatments were not there six months ago. They existed, but they were not being applied to COVID. Now we're getting more and more better and better treating 
uh, this disease. And finally, with the vaccines, we've seen again there, by the way, the testing did not work when the government was doing it on its own. It's when they engaged with laboratories, universities, with the pharmaceutical companies, the testing is really working now. And I'll give you a quick example. You all probably know about, some of you follow the English Premier League football. Uh, I support Chelsea Football Club. My, my title is Lord Bellamore of Chelsea. And uh, so the Football League, of course, had come to a standstill. And the, the Football League said, we haven't finished the season. The season normally finishes in May, June, and they hadn't been able to finish the season. So they came up with a way of holding the football matches without audiences. They said, the only way we can do this is if they tested, if everyone, the players, the referees, the coaches, the 1,500 people involved in these matches are tested regularly. So a testing company approached me, said, we've identified these professors at the University of Birmingham. Would you introduce us? With their help, we can get permission from the government to complete the Premier League season. So I had a small part to play, and our Birmingham professors supervised the testing, and the Premier League season was completed successfully without a single game being postponed or cancelled. And what happened was everyone, all those 1,000 players and referees and coaches, were all tested twice a week. They did over 42,000 tests. 50 people were found to be positive, and they were isolated, and the rest carried on, and the game continued. So collaboration again there made it happen. And finally, with the vaccines, we found here there are over 100 vaccine projects around the world, probably approaching 200 now. And one of the leaders in the race is Oxford University with the Oxford University vaccine in collaboration with AstraZeneca, British-Swedish company. So they go collaboration, university, British-Swedish company. And on top of that, AstraZeneca have collaborated with our very own Cyrus the Great, Cyrus Punawala of the Serum Institute of India. And Puna, the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world, who have got a contract out of AstraZeneca's 4 billion doses. Cyrus has got over a billion dose, a part of that. And he is taking the risk and producing hundreds of millions of these vaccines. I was with him here in England recently. And we went together to meet the Indian High Commissioner. Um, and we're all rooting for this Oxford vaccine to come through. And AstraZeneca themselves are making 100 million doses at risk. So if this vaccine is not approved for whatever reason and it fails in its phase three trials, Cyrus will have to destroy those and lose all that money, as will AstraZeneca. And they're doing that at risk because they believe if it works, they want to get it out there as quickly as possible to save as many lives as possible. Again, all happening through collaboration. So I could go on talking to you for hours, um, but we are in this, and, and, and I'll, I'll conclude with this before we go into the Q&A. One of my friends is um, Admiral Tony Johnson Burke, who's the master of the household for Her Majesty the Queen. And it was leaked in the press extracts from a memo that he'd written to his staff because what happened during the lockdown was the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh went to Windsor Castle. Now normally their routine is that they spend the week in Buckingham Palace and the weekends in Windsor Castle. And the Queen loves being in Windsor Castle. I mean if she had a way she'd probably be there all the time. Um, and so they decided to be in lockdown in Windsor Castle. And Admiral Johnson, Tony called it the bubble and where they were protecting basically the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And this memo leaked and I, I contacted the home and reading that memo, it was fantastic. And it, it, it basically said there is no running away from the ambiguity, the uncertainty, the fear that exists. You can't run away from it. It's a reality. It's how you deal with it. And at Harvard Business School, where I studied through executive education, I'm an alumnus, I received a paper. One of our professors, Boris Groisberg, one of my favorite professors, has been sending us papers that he's been writing uh, about the crisis and lessons. And he sent one about the Stockdale Paradox. And the Stockdale Paradox is about Admiral Stockdale, who, as a naval officer, was taken prisoner during the Vietnam War. And he was under captivity uh, for many years. I think it was about seven years, six, six years, a long time. Tortured, solitary confinement. Most of the people he was in prison with did not survive. And when they interviewed him afterwards and they analyzed the whole thing, he said there were those who were completely broken by the experience. 
they just couldn't take it. They didn't survive. At the other extreme, there were those who were just saying, we're going to be out by Christmas and we're going to be home in America by Christmas. They didn't survive. The way he survived is he accepted the horror of what he was going through and the reality of what he was going through as a reality with no false hope. But also, he had that faith to look long term and to have that long term strength. So that combination of dealing with reality and having that faith that you'll come through it in the end. And that's the situation we're in now. You've got to accept the reality. This is a nightmare from many, many points of view. And as Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep going. And we've got to keep going till we come out of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, Karan. It was most impressive and very, very enlightening. Uh, Dora, would you like to start the question round? Please unmute yourself. Yes. Um, Karan, I think there are a couple of questions already come through on the chat. So perhaps it's better if you tackle them. I think one of them is from Kersey Shroff on prospects for a future UK-US free trade agreement and which sectors of the two economies will be most commonly involved, according to you. If you look at the UK, uh, our number one trading partner uh, is the European Union. So about 45% of our trade, imports, exports, goods and services, is with the European Union. And that has been gradually going down over the years. It was over 50% a few years ago, and it will probably keep going down, but it is by far our biggest. And of course, it's a huge block of over 400 million people and 27 countries, uh, including some of the biggest economies in the world, Germany, France. And, but if you look at our number one single country as a trading partner, it's the United States. The United States makes up 18% as one country of our, of our goods and services trade. And it's the only, one of the rare countries, by the way, Britain is a net importer. We import more than we export. America is one of the few countries, we actually have a surplus uh, where we export more to America than they export to us. And of course, there's a very special relationship that's always existed between the UK and the USA, whether you go back to the Second World War, you go back to the First World War, um, we've always been allies and it's a, a special relationship. Uh, now, doing an FTA with America is not gonna be easy because you have issues like trading standards and, and um, particularly in, in the area of agriculture where some of the, the British agricultural farmers would say, well, the Americans do things in certain ways. And the example that's always thrown out is chlor chlorinated chicken. And uh, we don't do that over here and we will not. And they're of course worried about cheaper American agricultural produce, which is produced on a far greater scale. The American farms are giant, giant farms um, that we would not be able to compete with. So there are worries when it comes to a free trade agreement with America. Uh, and of course, the other thing is health. We have the National Health Service in the UK, which is a, a very loved institution. We also have private health, but private health is a very small compared to the national health, which most people are dependent on, which is free at the point of delivery for any British citizen um, from, from cradle to grave. So the, we're very worried that, that in any way our health service should not be privatized and the Americans might want access to that part of it as well. So the various issues that are involved um, in the free trade agreement that are challenges, and of course it depends on who the leader um, at the time is. Um, you know, so, and and, and another, another little bit of a problem has been the Northern Ireland protocol that I don't know if some of you followed. In Brexit, uh, Northern Ireland was the Achilles heel of Brexit is how I called it. In that here we had a country, we have the United Kingdom. When you say the, by the way, the UK, and you talk about Great Britain, there's a difference in Great Britain and the UK. Great Britain is England, Wales, and Scotland. And Scotland has been part of Great Britain for 300 years now. Northern Ireland is the bit that makes us the UK. So it's Great Britain and Northern Ireland makes up the United Kingdom. 
And people forget that Ireland only achieved its independence from the UK 100 years ago. And from that time in the 1920s, we've had an agreement with Ireland that we are a free movement area between Ireland and, and the rest of the UK. And Northern Ireland, when it was cut, so Northern Ireland belongs to the UK and Ireland is a separate country, we always said there must be free movement between Northern Ireland and Ireland, whatever happens. And throughout the IRA crisis and the terror that existed through the 70s and 80s and eventually was resolved by the Good Friday Agreement in 19, after Tony Blair became Prime Minister in 1998, that Good Friday Agreement brought peace to Ireland. And that has meant whatever happens, there's no hard border. During the Troubles, the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, there were over 270 armed by our armed forces, not police, checkpoints. Now there is no border. You hardly know if you're traveling between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So if you said, how can we break away from the European Union and still have this part of the United Kingdom that has got free movement when there will be free movement we stop with the rest of the European Union? Freedom of people, freedom of goods, services, capital. And so that has been a problem that we've been trying to resolve. And it was resolved through the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a compromise in the deal that was struck to enable Brexit to happen in January. And now it has surfaced again because they put through this bill through Parliament where the British government has openly said that it would be willing to break international law um, under certain circumstances through this internal market bill, which has caused a huge furor. So the Americans have said that the Democrats are in power. They will not do any free trade deal with the UK if we break the protocol and if we break the withdrawal agreement that we've had to do with Northern Ireland. And, and so we've got to be very careful. It's not that easy to do this free trade deal. Of course, the movement of people, movement of students, of academics, there's a lot that goes into a free trade deal with America. It is possible. We're very keen to do it. And by the way, since even before we've actually finished the transition period, Britain has just announced the Japan free trade deal. We've already agreed that, and that's huge. So, and, and, and that's already been agreed in this time in the midst of a crisis. Uh, Sam, would you like to ask the next question? Sorry, was that for me? Yes. Go ahead. Are you asking me, Yazdi? Yes, yes, go ahead, Sam. Uh, uh, Lord Current Billimoria, good listening to you. Now, just switching tracks a bit, I was wondering, since we are talking on a WZCC platform, if you would have some advice for us on what can we do to motivate our Indian Zoroastrian youth in India especially to be a lot more ambitious and driven than what I see they currently are. I mean, some of us uh, from our generation, like you and me, we achieved whatever little we could because I get the feeling that we were reasonably driven. Uh, I, I see that kind of lacking somewhere, especially in India. And I, I, I guess the job of WZCC is somewhere bring in that passion. How do we do that? Sam, great to see you, and uh, very nice to see you. Uh, thank you so much for your question. I, and and you know, this is, I, I believe that the, the best way uh, to predict the future is to look into the past. And if you look into the history of, of our community, and you look at how much um, our community has achieved over the decades. I, you know, the talk that I gave, I remember at the World Zoroastrian Congress in 2013 in Bombay, in Mumbai, was about the uh, achievement of the Zoroastrian community and the link with our religion going back over the centuries. And I think we have that inspiration that exists within our community already of, of um, the, the role models that exist, the amazing stories that exist. But I think we just need to look, look at the UK just today, and, and I think we should look wider, look at, look at what minority communities can achieve. Today it's been announced that Walmart, who've been in the UK, the biggest supermarket chain in the world, 
been in the UK for 20 years, since 1999, and they bought Asda, a northern supermarket chain, and they bought it for £6.7 billion in 1999, and in the midst of the crisis now, they've just sold it for £6.8 billion to two Indian brothers, the Issa brothers who I've met, Gujarati origin, 48 years old, and they, when Asda had bought, was bought by Walmart, at that time, just over 20 years ago, these brothers, whose father owned some petrol pumps, a couple of petrol pumps, started their first petrol pump and built up a business that now has thousands of petrol pumps around the world and have now bought out Walmart and bought Asda in the UK. I just think of this. That's and they, amazing. They, you know, they're not, and they're not Cambridge graduates or chartered accountants. They're from the northwest of London, near Manchester, not of the UK, near Manchester. If I give you another example, um, one of my YPO friends, I remember very clearly, 2005. In the summer of 2005, I was on a YPO trip, the Young Presidents Organization trip, and we were going to Alaska. And there was this young British Indian who had, who had been at Cambridge. I didn't overlap with him. And I, I can picture talking to him in August 2005. And he, he said, you know, my family business, my father had some shops and things. We sold them. And we've just come across these five shops in Blackpool and in, in North England called B&M. And we've just bought these stores. And at that time, Cobra Beer was really taking off. And I just thought, what are you doing buying a few shops in, in, in the Northwest of England? Today, B&M is valued twice the value of Marks and Spencer's. Twice the value of Marks wow. and Spencer's. And Simon Aurora and his two brothers are billionaires. And they've done that in 15 years. And they're in their 40s, young Indian origin. So it's happening in front of our eyes. There is nothing to stop our youngsters. And what's happening in India, the opportunities that exist in India are just going to be more and more phenomenal. And if you look at home delivery in this crisis, if the adapt, we've been so quick to adapt and adopt. What we're doing now, Satya Nadella, who, like me, attended the Hyderabad Public School, one of the school, seven schools that I attended, he said in the middle of this crisis, the head of Microsoft, he said, what we adopted and adapted in two months would have taken many, many years. Necessity is a mother of invention. We've done it. Home delivery, when all the restaurants were shut, people were home delivery. Home delivery is taken off. It was already taking off. Asda now has 700,000 deliveries per day capacity. It didn't have that six months ago. So you have to adapt and adapt very quickly. So India is, is massive opportunity. So our youngsters should just grab it and run with it. Thank you for the question. Welcome. So Adel, uh, does that give you some thoughts on what we should do at WZCC? Yeah, if, if I can interject, Sam, I, I think one difference I've noticed being part of WZCC that in India, the elders are very controlling, do not give the youngsters a chance to do what they want to do. Once they come abroad, age is not a criteria. You know, it, it doesn't, it depends on what you want to do and how you want to do it. But uh, I think the general atmosphere in India is age means you are, you know more and you don't give the ch uh, youngsters a, a chance to, to go forward. So part of the blame, I think, is the, also the older, you can't put it all on the youngsters. Maybe a communication program to the elders in India is required. <laughs> Well, if, if I may, just on that point, in, in the House of Lords, so when I joined the House of Lords uh, 14 years ago, I was, I think, the second or the third youngest peer in the House. Uh, today, I'm still one of the younger peers because the average age is 70. Now, if, if I can describe to you the first, when, we, when Parliament, of course, had to keep operating, and we shut for a while, and we said, we've got to open up again. How do we open up? We have to open up virtually. And because of um, COVID being so dangerous to older people, if the average age is 70, where many 80-year-olds were very active in the House of Lords, they said we can only op operate virtually. So we started these Zoom sittings of the Houses of Parliament. Now, if you can imagine some of these 70 and 80-year-olds 
uh, trying to use this technology in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> I, I could write a book about it. It would be a comedy. It was so hilarious. But they adapted very quickly. And then we moved on from Zoom sittings to hybrid. So now you can actually go into the chamber, but it's restricted to just 30 people because of social distancing. So we now have this, every sitting is in the house with some people in the chamber and others operating remotely. And it's not the same. You can't have debate. You can't have interventions, but you can actually get through the business in a sequential, organized manner. And we've done that so quickly. And even the 70, 80 or 80, late 80s have adapted to this and, and, and it's working. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Suresh Bhai Kotak, would you like to uh, yes. ask a question? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. See, it was very, very impressive. You have so much well conceptualized the whole, whole thing that it becomes very clear that we have to accept reality and adaptation is the most important point. In this reference, I would like to ask, how about the Chambers of Commerce role, especially with two aspects of India, where massive opportunity would be available. One is MSME, and second thing is supply chain, which, which, is, which could be unfolded in agriculture. Thank you for giving us a guidance. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Kotak. And um, you're absolutely right. I mean, the engine of any uh, economy are the, the SMEs. And, and I do, by the way, I think MSME is, is even more appropriate because whenever people uh, talk to me about, you know, your business career, I said, well, I actually started off initially as a micro business because there was two of us, my partner, Arjun Reddy and I. And then you build from a micro business to an S to a small business and then you build to an M to a medium business and then you might become a big business. Now I have a joint venture with the biggest, one of the biggest breweries in the world, Molson Coors. So the MSME is a far more accurate and of course in India you have really tiny businesses, whether it's the Kirana stores, uh, a lot of sole traders. Uh, so it is, it is a country full of SMEs and you have to empower and encourage those SMEs. And I think the biggest empower of it all is technology. And if you, if this technology now is so accessible and our mobile technology in India is one of the most affordable um, in the world. I mean, whether it's what Geo did in, in, in kickstarting that and in giving things away free, whichever way you look at it, the excessive, it's one of the cheapest, most affordable mobile technology in the world. And I think that is gonna be a, a great empower, including by the way, in the agricultural sphere um, and in the agricultural area, I've seen the supply chain, for example. There's so much technology being, friends of mine have got new platforms that are helping farmers get their goods to market quicker, more efficiently, getting more information, whether it's weather, whether it's market prices, whether it's access to sell their products, and all through, through technology. And, and at that technology enabler is the most powerful. Thing. And, and, and digital, by the way. We're so dependent on it over here, I've just, when you upgrade your, if any of you upgrade Wi-Fi in the UK or in the West or in America, you know, we're used to working at speeds of, let's say, 20. You can get up to 200 in one step. You can go 10 times faster. Just imagine if that broadband power was there throughout India to everyone in India, how much more empowering that would be. So I think that should be the priority in infrastructure is tech in Asia. And a, and a country like the UK, one of the wealthiest nations in the world, 66 million population, there are still 11 million people in the UK who do not have digital, then they cannot use um, digital and, and, and information at all. And they need to be trained. So there's a lot to do. Thank you for that question. Uh, how about the one more addition? What chambers of commerce should do to uh, create a good platform? The good thing about chambers of commerce, and I was for some years, going back over 10 years ago, the vice, vice president and vice chair of the London Chamber of Commerce. So I'm very aware. And my one of our counterpart organizations is the British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, so one of the, and the president of the British Chambers of Commerce is my colleague in the House of Lords, Baroness Ruby McGregor Smith. The Chambers of Commerce, the big advantage they have is that they are everywhere. 
that you're regionally in every town and every state um, and your national reach and they have a, a very good way of reaching out in particular to the SMEs and engaging the SMEs, having the meetings with the SMEs and, and, and giving them uh, knowledge, access to information, access to finance, uh, visits. Uh, so I've seen this firsthand. So absolutely, Chambers of Commerce have a big role to play in this. Thank you, Mr. Kurtle. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is a common trend of questions. How will a CBI help SMEs from India, maybe preferably the Zoroastrian SMEs? So the, the CBI in, in, um, in, the, in London has a big office. Uh, we're very well staffed. We have lots of um, economists, policy experts. And part of our office is the CII. The Confederation of Indian Industry actually has its offices in the UK inside the CBI's offices. So we are sister organizations. So my counterpart in India, Uday Kotak, uh, who I've known for many years, uh, of Kotak Mahindra and Kotak Bank. So um, I don't know if he's related to you, Mr. Kotak, but... Um, yeah, he... I'm his father. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what an honor for me to speak to you. Well, so your son and I are, are, are fellow presidents. And, yeah. and, and, we, and, and my, the, my first call that I made um, when I... When I um, became president of CBI, was with Chandrajit Banerjee um, and Uday uh, at the CII. That was my first international video call was with them. And we decided then, normally they come on an annual visit to the UK, the CII. It's a very high-powered delegation with many of the captains of industry. Noshad Forbes, for example, uh, was, was president of CBI. Uh, they would come across uh, with the director general and the team for a visit to the UK. And of course, that's not possible this year. So we decided to have a virtual visit. And a few weeks ago, we had a virtual visit. And, and, we, you know, and I, I chaired a particular session with, with Uday um, on, on climate change and on the whole green economy. Uh, so uh, yes, so for India, now here's a, a point I'd like to make. So you've got access, for example, through the CII. You've got access with the CBI. When this happened, the first thing we noticed, we said business needs information. People don't know what's going on. This is a shock. So in the middle of March, the moment the lockdown was, was announced, we started a coronavirus hub. So if you look up the CBI on the net, you can look up the coronavirus hub. And that's updated all the time with the latest information on what government help is available, what the latest work. And we said at a time like this, the CBI is a membership organization where you pay fees. Um, so you, know, you, you have to join it. It's quite expensive for big companies. Big companies will pay hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to be members of the CBI. And much, of course, much, much lower for SMEs. Um, but this, at a time like this, we said, we've got to give this information free. We started holding webinars, daily webinars. We'd get cabinet ministers, experts, health experts, industry experts speaking in these daily webinars. And again, we said, attended by thousands of people, this has got to be free to everybody, not just CBI members. We went one step further. We said, at a time like this, we business needs help. We offered free CBI membership for six months with no obligation to join afterwards to any business to join. Thousands of businesses took up that. So at a time like this, you've got to be completely open and you're powerful. You've got the resources opened up to everybody. Uh, so I would urge young Indians to, to look, look outwards, look to the UK. There's huge opportunity. For example, we have a global entrepreneur program that is one of my friends, Alpesh Patel, um, is one of the leaders of this run by the British government where if you've got a great idea and if you are eligible, you could actually come to the UK and the UK government will help you start up your, your business over here. Uh, it's quite competitive, but there are opportunities to even do that through the Global Entrepreneur Programme. So if anyone genuinely has a fantastic idea, I can put you in touch with Alpesh Patel with no promises, but you never know. Thank you. Robin, would you like to ask your question, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Yazdi. Uh, good afternoon, Karan. There's a bit Seth in the hair. Thanks for that. Look, I'll put my question in the chat, but I'll read it out anyway. Um, obviously, there are government grants to support uh, SME entrepreneurs as they frantically try and figure out um, how to stimulate our currently stagnant economy. Um, and, that, and that's important, of course. But I'm actually, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you mentioned uh, tech as, uh, as one of the key uh, instigators for getting our economy back, back running again, because I'm actually working on a project 
uh, to use tech to try and gain a deeper understanding of exactly how likely a potential grantee uh, will succeed and if their actual motivations and personality could be better understood during the due diligence process. So given your current role with the CBI, um, is this something that you think the CBI may be interested in exploring a little further? Absolutely. It sounds very interesting. If you could follow up with me afterwards on this, okay. I'd love to follow up on it. But again, with, with the tech area, there, I could give you example after example of how um, you can apply tech and move quickly. Now, and, and again, can you, in a tough time, when your business is on its knees, in our case, in the middle of the crisis, our, our restaurants were shut, our sales team were on furlough. I got approached by Prince Charles's uh, charity, the British Asian Trust. And they said, we want to help COVID victims in South Asia, of course, including India. I said, we want to hold a big curry night in and at the end of May and get the British public to have a curry at home, order a takeaway from a restaurant. Some of the restaurants are doing takeaways or from a supermarket or cook curry at home. And you know, you sell Cobra beer, get them to buy some Cobra beer from the supermarkets and raise some money for the British Asian Trust. So when I put it to my team, they said, what do you mean big curry night in? We'll have 10 nights. So we had 10, a big curry night in for 10 nights in May. We took our sales team off furlough. They got in touch with their customers. They got some of the restaurants to open up who are not open doing deliveries and takeaways. And we did this and we raised tens of thousands of pounds to the British Asian Trust for COVID victims in South Asia, raised awareness for the charity. And that was all in the middle of crisis. And one of the things that enabled us to do that was the technology. We were able to have a site where any one consumer could just get on there, find within their radius which restaurant was actually taking part in this where they could get a delivery from, directions of how to get there, et cetera, et cetera, all done within days. So similarly, when we did our Eat Out to Help Out extension in September, we were able within, I'm not exaggerating, in one week, we built a platform where you could, restaurants could register, consumers could find restaurants closest to them, directions of how to get to them, links to their menus, all done in a matter of days. That's technology. It's phenomenal. So can I, may I ask you Right, so may I ask a related question, and I know you touched on it earlier on, and you were hoping that someone may actually ask you the question about uh, the, uh, the, the, the track and trace um, um, uh, and you know, using technology and, and how we can, we can utilize that uh, for business growth as well. well thank, again. You, thank you. Well, I was hoping somebody would ask me that question. Um, well, I, I've been, I believe, and this is where sometimes, you know, business organizations will say, well, our, our expertise is the economy and the business, and the health is not our arena. But I think over here, the health crisis and the economic crisis are so intertwined. I've just made it my job to get as knowledgeable as possible about the health uh, aspect of this crisis and getting to know about the virus, getting to know about the treatments, getting to know about the vaccines, getting to know about testing. And of course, the, the demand shock, supply shock, reverberations in the country, around the world. So it affects everyone. And I said, how do we get out of this? And I knew testing was going to be one of the most important things. And okay, the World Health Organization was right, right at the beginning in March saying test, test, test. And of course, people were not testing. testing. And I got a friend of mine, a boarding school friend of mine from Uti, who's based in California, sent me in March, and I'm talking about March, he sent me an announcement from Abbott Laboratories in America that they had come up with an instant 15 minute test to tell you whether you had COVID or not. And at that time, it had to be done using a machine and you had, it was not, it was not in a laboratory, but it was a machine that could do it, but it was instant, 15 minutes and pretty accurate. I remember noticing that straight away and I shared it with my team at the CBI. Fast forward, you come to end of August, an announcement for Abbott Laboratories in America that they've brought out the Binax test. And the Binax test is on the size of a credit card where you take a sample, a swab, you put it on the card with an agent, 15 minutes, you get to know whether you've got COVID or not, instant. And at the moment, you can't do it at home on your own. You have to get someone to do it for you but it's only one step further that that will be something that you can just buy in a supermarket or order by mail. What's the cost? $5 each at the moment. They produce 10 million in August. They, they produce 10 million in September. This month they're producing 50 million. 
countries around the world are now ordering them. And what happens with this is when you have, and it's 97, 98% accurate. Now the, the real technical people on this call might say, hang on, that means you'd have false positives and false negatives if it's only 97, 98. It doesn't matter because if anyone tests positive, the first thing you do is you get a PCR test or a lamp test, which is 100% accurate to confirm it. So that covers the, the positive side of it. And with the negatives, if you're testing people twice a week, I gave you the Premier League football example, you're going to pick up people if you're doing it every, twice a week or every week. So if, if you have the ability, and a country like the UK, which is an island state, you could have everyone testing twice a week at a cost. What you do the sums, $5 times 66 million people times twice a week times, let's say we do that for the next six months is a fraction of the over 300 billion pounds we've already spent, let alone our economy that tanked by over 20% in the second quarter and is, is predicted and the unemployment we possibly might be having. If we could have regular testing in offices and factories at home, at airports, uh, at schools, at universities, our economy can just get on, on all cylinders without fear. And we'd be able to get on top of this virus. And I'm getting, trying to get the government to listen to this the technology is available now. If they can do this, it'll be transformational. Then when the vaccine comes along, then that's an additional way of getting on top of it. Thank you, Eric, everyone, for all your questions. Uh, we have also circulated a link along with the invitation. And if you can fill up your details and en enter the data, what you want Karan to handle at the CBI, we will pass it on to Karan and hopefully he will take it forward for whatever is interesting. Adil, would you like to propose a vote of thanks, please? Adil, may I just before you close, can I, can I just say one thing before you close? Yes. Um, sure. Well, well, two, two things, really. Firstly, thank you all very much for inviting me uh, to, to, to be with all of you. And I've greatly enjoyed this and, and the, the questions as well. So thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. WZC. Thank you again to Mayor and to Adel and to Yazdi and to Dorab and to, to all of you. Um, and if I just may leave you with, with two things. One is uh, that um, Camus, the famous philosopher, uh, said uh, plagues are, are evil things, but it's in plagues that people rise above themselves. And we're seeing this time and again around the world and the biggest of adversity, people are rising about themselves. And the next thing is, this is a huge, horrible time that it is. It's a huge learning experience. And we just had Gandhi Jayanti yesterday. Um, and Mahatma Gandhi, one of his famous sayings is, live as if you're going to die tomorrow and learn as if you're going to live forever. And we've just got to keep learning and, and keep going. And I'm sure we'll all be fine in due course. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karan for all the help that you have been giving over the years to WZCC. You are our hero in true sense. Thank you very and much. now I would like to invite Adel Dahar to deliver the vote of thanks. But Yassi, would you please put up the slide of uh, thank you for, for the organization? Okay, a uh, lot current Bellemoria. WZCC members, supporters, and friends. I would like to start by thanking Mayor Besanya and Yazdi Tantra for arranging and organizing this meeting. We would also like to thank all the participating organizations who are listed on the slide. CBI, Confederation of Indian Industry, IBPC Dubai, Indian Merchants Chamber, FICCI, OPPI, the Guild of Entrepreneurs, GINA, Merga Doma, ZTFE, and WZCC. Thanks to also to Percy Master uh, India and Shona's engineer in the UK for extending invitations to top officials of various organizations in India and UK. Sharna's received very positive response from the City Hindu Network and the Swami Narayan Temple, the largest in the UK. And thanks also to another Sharna's engineer, editor of Jami Jamshed for carrying articles about WZCC webinars. 
Now moving to the main attraction, it gives me great pleasure to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Lot Karan Villamoria on behalf of WZCC, the many Sikandrabad and Hyderabad people present today, including Nilofa and myself who grew up with Karan's mother's Italia family in Sikandrabad. Karan, we are living in a complicated, messed up world where there are natural forces for globalization, but many leaders are fighting it in the name of nationalism. And of course, COVID-19 has added a new dimension. Your talk today was right on the mark by being creative and innovative, taking calculated risk, being adaptable, turning setback, setbacks into comebacks, in short, being entrepreneurial. We can and should take advantage of the so-called touchless business opportunities created by the COVID environment. I believe Karan was a Remainer, that is against Brexit, but now facing reality has clearly taken it by the horns to boost Britain's economy by encouraging trade and commerce globally. And to do this, Britain has to promote entrepreneurship and there is no better person to do this than Karan. As you know, he started Cobra Beer as an entrepreneurial initiative by being different, by being first, and by being best. But what you may not know is that Karan was the founder and first WCC UK chapter chair. Karan and the current WCC chapter team are inviting you to the next WZCC Global Conclave in London, most probably in October 2021. They promised it to be a memorable event, so please do mark your calendars. Karan, as a token of our appreciation, WZCC would like to present you uh, with a gift. But what can we give a Lord who has everything? Well, here is what we decided. But to do that, Karan, you'll need to cross the pond to claim your gift. It'll be a private aerial tour of New York in a plane owned and pilot, piloted by our own Tus Daruara, followed with the tour of the New York Daramere and a sumptuous Laganu Bonu dinner. So oh, thank, thank you. Bob. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Karan, for the wonderful talk, for supporting WZCC, and for supporting the community at large. Thank you very much, Edo. Thanks so much for coming. What a present. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Great to be with all of you. Thank you very much and wish you all the best. And thank you. Thank you, distinguished speaker, Lord Billimoria, and all those who have joined us today for this wonderful webinar. Thank you once again, Edil, for your vote of thanks. Thanks, Kirsty and everyone, all those who have helped in making this webinar a success. God bless you all, and may we come out of this calamity soon. Thank you.